Okay, welcome everybody to the latest instance of the seminar. Uh, our first speaker today is Felix Brandt from the Technical University of Munich, and he'll be speaking on a natural adaptive process for collective decision making. Keep in mind that you're, um, uh, if you have a question, you should type the word question in capitals into the chat and we'll make sure it gets asked. Okay, it's up to you, Felix. All right, um, thanks very much, Bill. And also thanks for having me in the seminar. So um, in this talk, I will present a dynamic voting procedure where alternatives are randomly drawn from an urn whose contents are modified over time. So this is a um, joint new work with Florian Brandl, who's also here, I believe. And, and we have worked on this for quite a long time. Um, and uh, we actually just uploaded a draft of the corresponding paper half an hour ago and will submit to the archive later. Okay. so. Let's begin with some basic assumptions um, that are usually made in social choice theory. Um, well, these assumptions are not made throughout the literature, um, but they are fairly basic standard assumptions in the default setting that we are all familiar with. So the setting where we have a preference profile that is mapped um, to a winner or maybe a set of winners or maybe a lottery over winners. Um, so in this setting, it is usually assumed that we have a fixed set of voters. We also have a well-defined fixed set of alternatives. Um, voters are assumed to be able to rank order all the alternatives, which, which can be quite a demanding assumption in some settings. Um, preferences are also fixed as well, because we are just talking about a single election. And um, perhaps most importantly, there's the assumption of a central trusted authority um, that has access to all the preferences that is able to compute the outcome, which as computational social choice theorists, we know can be quite challenging. So for some rules like Kemeny's rule or Dodgson's rule, it has been shown that computing the outcome is actually computationally difficult. Um, and finally, um, the authority also has to convince the voters of the outcome's correctness. Um, and this uh, task is particularly challenging if you think about randomized rules. So some of the rules that have been studied uh, return a lottery over the alternatives. Um, and in this case, the authority needs to convince the voters that the lottery was actually executed faithfully. Okay, so, so far for the standard assumptions in the common literature. Now, um, what we try to achieve in the paper is the following. So um, we want to devise an uh, ongoing and adaptive voting process that satisfies desirable axiomatic properties. Um, and on top of that, it should be possible that voters may arrive and leave and change their preferences over time. Um, we never ask voters for their complete preferences. So rather, we just only elicit small parts of the preferences on demand. And finally, we would like to get rid of the central authority. So instead of a central authority, we only want to have a single device, namely an urn that is filled with balls. And these balls correspond to the alternatives. And with this urn, we can only do two things. So we can randomly sample a ball. And we can replace one of the sampled balls with a ball of another type. Okay, so these are the two primitive operations we allow on this urn. Now, um, let me show you how the particular process that we have in mind, how it looks like. Okay, so we have a bunch of voters. So in the example here, it's fixed to four voters, but as I said, so the number of voters in principle could vary. Um, and then we have an urn, and this urn is filled with balls. Okay, so and um, each of these balls is labeled with the name of an alternative. So in the example here, we have four different alternatives, A, B, C, D. Um, the exact composition of these balls doesn't matter for our result. So we put all the balls into the urn and then the procedure starts, starts as follows. So we uh, uniformly select one of the voters at random. Okay, so now the second voter is selected and then this voter gets to draw two balls from the urn randomly. So let's say these two balls are labeled with alternatives A and B. And then this voter is asked, which of these two alternatives do you prefer, A or B? So it's a pairwise comparison. And let's assume that in this case, um, this voter prefers alternative A to alternative B. And this means that alternative A is declared the winner of this round. Okay. And on top of that, we are going to change the distribution in the urn very slightly by relabeling the losing ball, which is the yellow ball in the example here, with the color of the winning ball. Okay, so this yellow ball labeled B will be relabeled with A. And then both balls will be put back into the urn. 
Okay, and this is one round of the process, and we keep on doing this for many rounds. Okay, so in each of these rounds, one of the voters is selected at random. We draw two balls. We have this pairwise comparison between these two balls, and then we recolor or relabel the balls before or one of the balls before putting them back in. So there's one tiny little detail that we still have to do. So you may have noticed if you just use this process as I described it, then it's possible that um, um, that some type of balls completely disappear from the urn. So it might be possible that we just relabel the last yellow ball and then there are no yellow balls left. And if we keep on doing this for a long time, this will actually happen with probability one. So there's one tiny detail that we need to do. And this is that every once in a while, we draw one of the balls at random and we relabel it with the random color. And then we put it back in, we call it a mutation. Okay, and then we keep on following this process. Okay, and then the key question um, that we study in the paper is, what can we say about this sequence of winners? Or more precisely, what can we say about the distribution of winners that you see, oops, uh, oops, 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 no, I, that you see um, at the bottom of the screen. Why can't I jump now? Okay, let's just go over the animation once again. It was so much mark, so for some reason I cannot jump forward. Okay, so that's the mutation. Um, and then we have the sequence that results from this process. Okay, and, and the question that we might ask for the sequence, for instance, does it converge? And if so, against what does it converge? Um, but before we get there, um, I would like to summarize the, the rules of this process that I just described. So we have capital N as the number of balls, um, but each ball carries the label of an alternative. Then we will randomly select a voter. Um, if, for instance, um, two balls of the same kind are drawn, this is not a big deal. Well, then we have a clear cut winner and then no ball needs to be relabeled. And similarly, we can handle indifference. If the voter is indifferent between two balls, then the voter can arbitrarily pick the winner and we again don't need to relabel anything. Um, what's also important is that the initial distribution is completely irrelevant. Um, so for instance, we could start the process by having each voter put one ball of her choice into the urn or maybe 10 balls of her choice into the urn. And finally, the last bullet here is that we have the small probability of mutations, which is quite important. Now, the result that we show is the following. Um, so we prove that if the number of balls in the urn is sufficiently large, then the empirical distribution of winners almost surely converges to a lottery close to a maximal lottery. So how close it is to a maximal lottery depends on the mutation rate. So the smaller the mutation rate, the shorter is the distance to the maximal lottery. However, we cannot set the mutation rate to zero because otherwise, as I described earlier, with probability one, the distribution in the urn will become degenerate. Um, so I, I haven't described what a maximal lottery is. Maybe some of you know, so I'm going, I'm going to define them on the next slide. So for now, it suffices to know that a maximal lottery is a lottery over the alternatives with desirable properties based on the voters' preferences. Um, now, a little bit more formally, the statement that we prove um, is the following. So we have some delta greater than zero. So that is the distance from the maximal lottery. So we fix that. And then we show that for this delta, there exists a lower bound on the number of balls um, and a mutation rate um, R, such that the following statement here is true. So and this statement says that the probability that this limit here lies within an, uh, with, uh, within an delta distance of a maximal lottery is actually one. So it's a probability one event. That's why it says almost surely up there. Now, what is this, what is this term here? So um, X is a random variable because we are, we are modeling this um, urn process as a Markov process. So it's a random variable where the states are the actual distributions in the urn. So it depends on the number of balls and the mutation rate. Um, then we divide this by N, which is the number of balls. Uh, so we have it normalized to the unit interval. So we get an actual lottery. And then we take the average over all the rounds um, where we have drawn balls so far. 
Okay. Um, so um, what we prove in the paper um, is actually a slightly stronger statement or a somewhat stronger statement, um, but that requires even more notation. So I gave you the easier version. So what we show in the paper is that the earned distribution is close to a maximal lottery most of the time. So that means by setting N, the number of balls, and R appropriately, um, we can make the process be arbitrarily close to a maximal lottery for arbitrarily long fractions of time. Okay, so the actual distribution in the urn does not converge. So that's also something important to realize. Um, it only gets close to a maximal lottery most of the time. And um, the average distribution does converge as in the statement above. Okay, um, now let's uh, talk about maximal lotteries. So some of you may have seen this slide before. Um, actually, when I was working on my slides the day before yesterday, uh, my, my little son came into the room um, and was really annoyed and said, why do all of your presentations contain a picture of the funny guy with the large pipe? <laughs> and, and then I told him about well, the guy with the pipe and also the guy with the striped shirt had a really good idea a long time ago. Um, so Germain Crevara and Fishburne proposed maximal lotteries as a randomized voting rule. And um, so given the preference profile, it returns a set of lotteries, which, uh, which supposedly have nice properties. And this function is a so-called C2 function. That means it only depends on the pairwise majority margins. Um, so this is what we have defined here. So um, we can construct a matrix of pairwise majority margins where for any alternative uh, or any pair of alternatives, X and Y, we have the number of voters who prefer X to Y minus the number of voters who prefer Y to X. And once we have this, um, then we can define a maximal lottery quite concisely by just writing that this vector matrix product um, this on the left hand side here yields a, yields a row vector um, which is non negative. Okay, so and if you're familiar with game theory, this means that the mixed equilibrium strategy of the symmetric zero sum game M, um, uh, that P is a mixed equilibrium strategy of the symmetric zero sum game M. So what you can do is you can just treat this matrix as a symmetric zero sum game, um, and then the lottery is maximal if and only if it is an equilibrium or maximum strategy. And this implies that this lottery is as good as any other lottery in a well-defined sense. And I think um, most naturally, you can think about maximal lotteries as randomized Condorcet winners. So just in contrast to classic Condorcet winners, randomized Condorcet winners in this sense are guaranteed to exist because of the minimax theory. Okay, so let me show you an example. Um, so here we have a preference profile with 14 alternatives. So in order to compute um, a maximum lottery, we need to compute um, the majority margin matrix. Um, and then we need to find a vector which um, multiplied with this um, matrix gives a row vector with non-negative entries. Um, and here you can already see, if you look closely, um, that um, this row of the matrix here contains non-negative entries. Okay, so we can have a degenerate maximal lottery, which puts all the probability on alternative C. Um, and this also is the case because in this uh, matrix game, we have a pure Nash equilibrium. We have a unique pure Nash equilibrium, which is to play C for the row player and C for the column player. Um, and um, this is exactly the case if there's a Condorcet winner, because in this preference profile on the left-hand side, C also happens to be a Condorcet winner. And whenever there's a Condorcet winner, a maximal lottery, they put all the probability on the Condorcet winner. Okay, so let's look at a slightly more interesting example. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change the preferences of these four voters between C and D. So we are swapping C and D, and then in the majority margin matrix, these two entries will also be changing. Right, and then the result, then we don't have the Condorcet winner anymore um, because well, this row also contains a negative entry. Now there's no single row which contains non-negative entries. So maximal lotteries actually do have to randomize in this example. And the resulting lottery is the two over seven, four over seven, one over seven lottery on the left-hand side. Um, and such a lottery can, for instance, be found um, using linear programming. Okay. Um, so I did mention that maximal lotteries have desirable properties. So I guess in the interest of time, I also need to keep this short. Um, so the last couple of years, we spent a lot of time analyzing the properties of maximal lotteries. And we also gave some axiomatic characterization 
uh, characterizations of maximal lotteries. So some desirable properties that are satisfied by maximal lotteries are the Condorcet consistency, as you have seen, they do not suffer from the no-show paradox, which is quite nice. Um, they're invariant under the removal of losing alternatives, which means if you remove an alternative that gets probability zero, then the maximal lottery doesn't change. And they also satisfy independence of clones. Um, and then uh, well, these uh, characterizations that are listed down there are basically characterizations where we looked at classic impossibility theory from social choice, such as errors impossibility or the no-show paradox. And then we translated the axioms to the probabilistic setting. And rather than an impossibility, we got a complete characterization of maximal lotteries. Um, the last bullet here is also noteworthy because you may have realized that in our result for this earn process, we don't actually get maximal lotteries. We only get something that is close to maximal lotteries. Okay, so and that means that could in principle mean that all of these axioms break down because we get something different than the maximal lottery. However, maximal lotteries or the function that maps to maximal lotteries um, satisfies upper hemi continuity. And because of this continuity, we also get these axiom, axioms in an approximate sense. So if we have something that is close to a maximal lottery, it also in a well-defined sense uh, approximately satisfies these axioms. Okay, but now um, let's look at some examples uh, of the earn process that I described in the beginning. So here's a very simple uh, preference profile. We have three voters, three alternatives, and clearly A is the Condorcet winner. Um, now we can run the earn process uh, for that and then get a nice diagram like this one here. So in this simplex, um, every, every point in the simplex corresponds to a distribution within the urn. And the green line shows, um, um, the actual distribution in the urn over time. Okay, and the red line shows the time average of distributions in the urn. So essentially what we are doing here, so we are starting in the middle of the simplex because we start in this example, we start with, the, uh, with an urn um, which is uniformly distributed. Okay, so all three types of uh, balls, ABC, have the same number of balls in the urn. Um, and then we start this random process. And this random process is essentially a random walk within this triangle and where you are going depends on the majority margins and the mutation rate. Okay, so and since there's a Condorcet winner, it's, you're more likely to go up than go down. So this path here is tilted to the left because uh, a majority of voters prefer alternative B to alternative C. Um, and sometimes we also have these mutations and we have this nice uh, like green little random walk and the red line shows the average. Um, one thing that I think is uh, important to realize here is that the preference profile that I'm showing you only contains three voters, but the process only depends on the majority margins. So we could have an equivalent preference profile with the same margins, which has say 3 million voters, and the process could look exactly the same, right? So it's, it's, it's not that it's in any way restricted that, it's, uh, that this uh, only works for a small number of voters. Okay, so let's look at another example, um, which gives this nice, Figure, which looks like a children's drawing to me, but it's, uh, it's funny how this random process actually works. So in this example, um, we have the classic Condorcet cycle on, on the left-hand side, you can see the preference profile. So the unique maximal lottery is to randomize one third, one third, one third. Um, and here we start the process with a completely degenerate urn. So we start in one of the corners. So all balls are of the same color. Then we start the random process. And then the, this green line shows how the distribution in the urn is slowly getting closer to the maximal lottery, but it's not really converging. It's only getting closer and closer. And what we have proven is that it stays close to a maximal lottery most of the time. The average distribution in the urn, which is the red line, actually converges to a maximal lottery, um, as you can also see in the figure. Okay, so here's one more example, but I think I'll skip that one in the interest of time. So maybe in the questions period, we can come back to that example in case you're interested. Um, but I would also like to talk a little bit about related work because that's quite fascinating. So there's lots of related work. So for instance, there's a paper by Jean-Francois, I'm not sure whether he's here, but the paper by Jean-Francois and his son Benoit about an earned process for tournament solutions. It's slightly different. So there you draw three balls and one ball is added in each round. So the ball, the, the urn actually gets larger and larger. Um, then of course, this is also related to equilibrium dynamics. So uh, methods like fictitious play, multiplicative rates, because we are essentially talking about symmetric zero sum games. But what I'm most fascinated by are all these um, applications in the natural sciences. So in fact, um, about five years ago, when Florian and I were already working on this paper, 
Um, we were contacted independently by physicists and biologists because they were interested in our work on symmetric zero sum games and tournament solutions. And when we discovered that they are actually working on processes, continuous processes that are very similar to the processes that we are studying for maximum lotteries, that was a, quite a fascinating experience because in their work, it's also about pairwise interactions between certain entities, particles, animals, plants, or mo mo molecules. Um, and then in some cases, they also study the time average um, of these processes and show that it converges towards an equilibrium strategy of an underlying symmetric zero sum game. Okay, so almost perfectly on time. So this is my last slide. Um, so let's conclude and maybe recap some of the nice properties um, of this process. Um, but actually the first property is something I haven't mentioned so far. Um, so maximum lotteries as a randomized social choice function do not satisfy strategy proofness. I did mention they satisfy nice properties, but they are not strategy proof because some of you may know the random dictatorship theorem. If you want to have Pareto optimality, then only random dictatorship satisfies strategy proofness. But this earned process satisfies a nice version of myopic strategy proofness because in each round, a random voter is, uh, faces the choice between two alternatives. And if you only think about the current round, you are best off just by picking your more preferred alternative. Um, of course, if you think in the long run about the actual distribution in the urn, then it's not strategy proof anymore, but it satisfies this myopic version where you only think about the current round. Um, so we only elicit very little information about preferences. So we only ask for isolated pairwise comparisons. And this is not only important because of say privacy protection, but also because in many cases, voters don't really come to the voting booth with the complete ranking of all the alternatives. So in some cases, you are not sure about your own preferences. And in this case, you only have to make up your mind about single pairwise comparisons in, in each of the round in case you are selected at random. Um, the verifiability is also a nice thing because with, if you just want to implement maximum lotteries without a process like this, then you could run a computer and execute the lottery, but then of course there could be doubt whether this was actually executed faithfully, but here we have a simple physical procedure which implements maximum lotteries. And finally, the flexibility that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, so for the process, as you may have realized, it doesn't matter whether voters, how many voters there are, there can be new voters arriving, they can change their preferences over time because anything that happens um, that has happened so far doesn't matter. So it's a memoryless process. So we are always, when something changes, we are always going in the right direction, which is the direction of a maximum lottery. Um, so one other thing that I just mentioned very quickly, and you can ask me about it in case you're more interested. So in addition to these natural phenomena that I mentioned on the previous slide, um, there are lots of other applications because it's a very basic process of pairwise interactions and then the convergence um, of this process. Um, so we, we came up with a model of opinion formation, which, which we think also is a nice, nice application um, or more descriptive application of the same process. And finally, um, since I'm a computer scientist, um, I'm, I'm actually fascinated by the fact that this earned process approximately solves a linear program, right? Because as I mentioned earlier, for computing maximum lotteries, you need to solve a linear program um, and solving these specific linear programs that are required for maximum lotteries for these symmetric zero sum games is actually as hard as solving any linear program. So it's what this process is doing, it's solving a p-complete problem, not np-complete, but p-complete. So one of the hardest problems within P. Okay, so that's it for now. Um, thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. We have some uh, historic breakthroughs here in terms of abuse of the word question in the chat that I've never seen before. There are people who type question but have no questions and other people who type question but have multiple questions. So the first one is Franz Dietrich, and he was the one who typed question but didn't type a question. Franz, did you have a question? I, I do have a question. So I'm not supposed to type the question, or am I supposed to type the question? You are supposed to type the question after the after the capital letters question. I'm, oh, I'm... sorry for that abuse. Okay. So uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, first of all, I'm a bit puzzled about the notion of a maximal lottery. What exactly does it represent? It seems to say that uh, there is a positive, a non-negative expectation of something, maybe of a ma majority margin. Um, I, it would help to me to, to know whether there's, in what sense it is maximal. 
in, with respect to which kind of relation over lotteries is that kind of lottery maximal? And perhaps you have a characterization, a lottery is maximal with respect to this and that, if and only if. Right. Um, well, that, yeah. that, that is a first question. And, and then if I, well, I will not ask the second question because that would be another abuse. But if there's time <laughs> at the end, then Bill can allocate me a second question. So if I may, I will reshare my screen now because I would like to go back to the slides of the definition of maximum sure. lotteries. Um, right here. Um, okay, so so I'm, I'm talking about this thing here. Um, so, but so I think one thing you were referring to is this zero here. So the, the zero comes from the fact that we are talking about the symmetric zero sum game. That means the value of this game is zero. So in any symmetric zero sum game, the best thing you can achieve for sure um, by playing a maximum strategy is zero. So by playing this strategy, um, you guarantee your security level um, in this matrix game, which is actually zero. Then mm -hmm. um, for another interpretation, maybe this thing here might be um, relevant. So the, the reason why Fishburn called it maximal lottery is because it is at least as good as any other lottery in the following sense. Um, so uh, mathematically, this uh, inequality here holds, but one way to to get some intuition in that is is that um, the expected number of voters who prefer the outcome of P to the outcome of Q is at least as large as the expected number of voters who prefer the outcome of Q to the outcome of P. Okay, I so see. and that's also uh, the sense in which this could be called a randomized Condorcet winner, in an expected sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, we have a question from Mark, but Mark, was, did uh, Florian answer your question to your satisfaction? Yes, all done, thanks. Okay, uh, Daniel Eckert, you had a question. Um, yeah, um, the question was whether there was any issue with path dependency or whether your uh, convergence result addressed this. Uh, path, path dependence in which sense? Um, in the sense that the sequence uh, uh, in, in which um, um, voters uh, are drawn uh, and uh, and balls are drawn might um, uh, affect the result. Well, it's, it's just a random result, so right. So it's um, with uh, some probability anything can happen. So actually, what we show is that this holds with probability one. So that means there's a possible sequence of like very poor random choices um, in which the convergence result doesn't hold. But um, with probability one, so that means almost surely, um, this will converge uh, to a maximal lottery. But in each of these rounds, we have random choices. Um, I'm not okay. sure whether that answers your question. But... Thank you. OK, um, Marcus, you had uh, the other abuse of the word question. Um, was there any questions left that were not answered by Florian? Florian answered most of my questions. I did have another question at the end um, when um, Felix mentioned that um, the, he, this um, sort of uh, random algorithm kind of approximately solves a linear program. It occurred to me to wonder, um, is it possible to code any linear program as a maximal lottery problem? So in other words, would this be like a general solution yes, method for approximately? Yes. That's pretty sweet. That's, so that, that's a kind of a nice spin-off result right there, right? Cool. Okay, good. Yeah, but that, that is already known. So it's already known that solving symmetric zero-sum games is just as hard as solving a linear program in general. But and now you have a now you have a random algorithm for doing it. This is my point. Yes, so that's, that's right. So that's right. yeah, that's why I sometimes think like the last bullet is something that could be of independent interest. Yeah. Right. Good. Thank you. May okay. I ask a question? Uh, let's finish the ones um, uh, on the chat first, and then we'll go to, the, to uh, spontaneous questions from the audience. Um, Marcus, um, uh, was your question addressed by Florian? Um, I think it was, maybe just a minor clarification. So basically, I think if I understand correctly, is if you don't have this mutation rate, then you can run into problems. But even then, these problems, they happen kind of Rarely, or I don't, I don't get, I don't exactly get the probability one thing, and then on the other hand, uh, Florian is saying these execution happen very rarely. Yeah, so it is a bit, it is a bit difficult to to really pass what the result actually says. So I also sometimes am confused by the statement. Um, 
So what is quite important is, is that um, it is, so it's an existence result. So in particular, with respect to the number of balls. So we have this lower number of balls n zero, uh, this lower bound of number of balls n zero. And we show there exists some lower bound on the number of balls such that this process converges uh, with probability one. Um, but um, we, it's, it's non-constructive. Um, okay, so that means, for, uh, first of all, it means because it is connected to this delta. So for any delta, if we can fix how close we want to get to a maximal lottery. Um, um, and then we have shown that there exists some number of balls which is large enough and some mutation um, rate R, um, which interestingly can also be too small. So it has to be in the right window. Um, and then this process converges with probability one. Um, Okay, there was a question um, that had not been typed. Gabriel, was that from you? Yeah, yeah, I don't know how to raise my hand. Um, it's about the strategy proofness because as you mm -hmm. said, it is a myopic uh, strategy or mm -hmm. you assume that. Uh, so I wonder whether you have studied the case where, uh, I mean, you know the results at each step or I don't know which actually example you have in mind, but uh, uh, if you know, I mean, the colors of the ball at each step, you mm -hmm. may change your strategy. Uh, or, but if you don't, I mean, you don't. So, I th because an example which is a little similar is the case of votes on internet when people, you know, express their votes. And there has been studies that show that. I mean, the way people be behave is very different depending on whether they know how mm -hmm. the other people before vote or not. Okay, so I, it seems to me that you you uh, like um, want to address this assumption that it's only myopically strategy proof. So if, if people are yeah, keep looking yeah, ahead yeah. in the future and they yeah, take into exactly. account future distributions in the urn, so if if they think about everything that is going to happen, then it's clearly not strategy proof because otherwise maximum lotteries sure. itself would be strategy proof. But one thing that one could do that we have thought about but haven't formalized it yet is you could have a model where you have some discounting so that the future matters less and less the further it is away. Um, and then perhaps one could prove something like a stronger version of this myopic strategy proofness where you not only look at the current round, but you also look at future rounds with some discounting. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, yeah, so I, we don't know much uh, beyond this myopic strategy proof in the sense. We haven't, haven't really thought about strategic issues in the long run. Okay. Okay, at this point, there are three um, more questions in the chat, and I think we'll have to quit the uh, question session after we handle those three. The first of them is from Javier Mora. Javier, you want to unmute? Yes, well, I... Uh, I still don't understand completely, but I was, uh, I was, uh, you gave this final interpretation about opinion formation. Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, I sometimes I ask myself whether it's good or, or bad that people uh, argue between themselves when, before a votation, before a vote. Okay. And okay. so it looks like this can, could be interpreted in the way that, uh, in uh, this process of uh, interacting between people could be good to form the, the right final opinion. I don't know whether some interpretation of mm -hmm. this could be. Yeah, so let me explain it a little bit more detail in what I meant by this opinion formation because I only sketched it very briefly. So this model is not really about voting. Um, so here the setting is a bit different. So the balls actually correspond to agents. Okay, so each agent corresponds to a ball in the urn setting and an agent has a certain opinion, which is the alternative that was associated with the balls. And then we have random interactions between agents. Um, and if two agents come together and then if they have different opinions, they try to convince each other um, of their opinion and how successful they are is given by a school symmetric matrix of, um, or not a school symmetric, but a symmetric matrix of probabilities, which corresponds to the majority margin matrix. And then um, in this interpretation of the model, so there are no preferences um, and there's no voting procedure, but the statement that we have shown then shows that if you keep on running this process for a long time, then the um, distributions of uh, the, distri the average distribution of opinions within the society converges to a maximal lottery of this matrix of pairwise comparisons. Okay, but it's, it, is, it is detached from the voting setting. It's more 
of a model of describing um, how opinions are diffused in a, in a society. And you, you mentioned at the beginning that preferences are fixed, they don't change. No, actually, yeah, so I mentioned in the beginning that in the standard literature preferences are fixed, but here in, the, in this uh, model also for this earned process, preferences can actually change over time. Ah, okay. So that, that's one of the advantages that what is mentioned here under flexibility. So if preferences change over time, then the earned process will just go um, in another direction, but it always walks towards a maximum lottery. And everything that has happened so far doesn't matter because it's only a finite number of rounds. But one thing you could, so preferences could change, voters could leave, voters could arrive. We can even remove alternatives or add alternatives. So if you have a new alternative, you can just add some extra balls into the urn and everything still works fine, right? Removing alternatives is a bit trickier, but it, it could still work. Okay, among the questions remaining in the chat, I think the only one that has not been addressed by Florian is one from um, Peter. Peter, do you have a question? Do you want to uh, ask a question about speed? Yes, I'm curious uh, whether the speed of convergence is fast enough for that this ever can be practical for solving real linear programs. So if it converges with the square root, like many statistical tests, that wouldn't be very fast. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's a very good question. And we are currently actually working on this. So Florian is currently uh, proving that it uh, uh, converges exponentially. So of course the process is limited by the fact that, that we only change uh, one ball at a time in each of the rounds. Um, but given this limitation, it actually converges quite quickly. Um, for the linear programming application, I'm, I'm not so sure. So it's, I'm, it's, there are certainly, so I think the main benefit for linear programming lies not in the fact that, it's, that it outperforms existing algorithms, which it surely doesn't, because it's also only, it's always in an approximate sense only, but we can exactly solve linear programs if we want to. But I think the more surprising fact is that we can have this very simple natural process. So you can even think of like a, like a, uh, like a bunch of molecules or something solving a linear program but that because the rules for the process are so extremely simple. So it's more of a conceptual contribution, I think. In terms of social choice, it's interesting to note that for if there's a conversion winner, like in this example here, convergence is, ex, uh, is actually quite quick. So you can also see in this graph here that um, it, it doesn't waste much time. Um, and um, well, in, for most realistic distributions of preferences, Condorcet winners are guaranteed to exist. And, and even the simple case of a Condorcet winner is, is not that trivial. So it's, we also need to set the mutation rate right and proving that it converges for the Condorcet winner case is, is not obvious. And that's already surprising by itself. And it's, it's quicker than for the other cases. Remember the Gratian algorithm that was also approximate and you could wrap it up in the end with an approximation method. Right, right. Um, yes, I do, but it's um, I, I, I don't believe um, that this method will be like uh, will advance state of the art linear program solvers. It's it's more um, the fact that you can have agents who have you follow just very simple rules to jointly compute a linear program. Which, um, which, that I think is more of a novel contribution, not challenging. Thanks. Well, the wealth of questions suggest the popularity of the talk. So let's thank the speaker one more time. Um, unmute and thank. Thanks. And now uh, Dominic is going to assign you to a, um, a breakout room, which you may join for the next 10 minutes or not, depending on your preference. And then we'll be back for the second talk in about 10 minutes. Very good. Um, welcome back, people. Our second speaker today is Klaus Nehring from University of California, Davis. He'll be speaking on the median rule in judgment aggregation, extension to weighted judgment contexts. Okay, you can share your screen, Klaus. Is that, uh, does everyone see my screen? Yes. Good. Um, I, uh, um, the, this is joint work with uh, Marcus Pivato. Um, it has been long in the making. Finally, the uh, paper just appeared, was posted last week and in uh, economic theory, it's open access. So if you just type the title of the talk, 
you can um, you can get access to the paper. Um, I was triggered to uh, present it here in this community um, by an, an anonymous referee um, who uh, apparently is from is a computer scientist and who, who connected uh, strongly with the paper. He felt that the um, the median rule, which I'm going to talk about, is the has been studied more than any other rule by the uh, theoretical computer scientists. And he uh, felt that he considers the maximization of it import, important and probably more important than the maximization of any other judgment aggregation rule. That's what the uh, focus of this um, paper is. I will be um, struggling with the 20 minutes. Um, Bill Zwicker gave me some sagacious uh, advice how to um, handle it. Um, first, let's, I should think about the talk as a talk of, of 10 minutes, where well, that's uh, a good aim. And uh, second, if I get run into difficulties, I should omit the vowels, where well, there will be quite a few vowels omitted. So if you are a little bit uh, missing something, well, then um, I, I was trying to omit the vowels. Um, you can, the aim will be, uh, the aim of our work in, in this work is at generality. We have also quite a lot of examples and in principle in a longer talk, I would, it would be nice to discuss, discuss some specific examples which you can find in the paper. Um, but here it will be pretty abstract. Uh, one, just as a slight advance warning, uh, there is, um, uh, price to be paid for that level of generality is that uh, a key axiom we are going to introduce is uh, somewhat heavier, let's say, than um, typical axioms would be. But I think it is uh, for, the, for the purpose it does, it is uh, very fine. So uh, as applications, um, there will be uh, there, there are many, as I mentioned, there can be one can aggregate various type of relations, multi-winner elections with diversity constraints, um, assignment problems, um, the uniform legal treatment of heterogeneous cases, and of the extent, various extensions of the Ken Kemeny rule to uncertainty and multiple criteria. Um, the, um, uh, I would start so the, the framework is uh, an extension of some generalization of the standard judgment aggregation framework. So we start from a set of issues K um, and each voter and the group uh, forms a view, sometimes also called judgment set on each of the issues. Um, so um, the view is an element of the, uh, um, plus minus one K, the power set of K. And um, we, dis we distinguish there is a between a set of admissible output views, views the group uh, that will be the group will hold and uh, a space of admissible input views. Why the, uh, the views um, uh, individual voters uh, can uh, can form in the typical, you can think of y equal to x that has the little, um, well, it doesn't undermine your understanding at all, but there are interesting cases when one really wants to look at essentially larger input spaces. So for instance, in quite a few cases, it's interesting to look at all um, the entire power set as the input space, which means basically we have approval inputs, but the outputs um, can be constrained, for instance, in if you have if you select a committee and you want uh, the co co committee to satisfy the elected committee to satisfy certain diversity constraints, you may ask at the same time, you may ask from individual, individual voters just their uh, view on each candidate individually without disregard of those constraints. And then uh, there is as another. Um, uh, Kind of non standard ingredient, um, there is a vector of issue weights where the um, 
the aggregator the, um, that is the, the uh, anyway the group or the decision maker who uses the inputs um, has uh, determined uh, how important it is uh, each uh, it is to um, agree to track the uh, views of the um, individual voters have been reflected in the group decision. That's a rough um, rough paraphrase. So we have um, so formally. We have our basic object is the judgment context, which is a quadruple consisting of these uh, four ingredients. Um, just a few words on issue weights, which are non-standard. In many cases, um, one can, um, uh, weights can be uniform, in, in which case normally they would, that would be kind of implicit in certain standard uh, uh, settings, um, and that could be justified by, by symmetry of the judgment spaces. So for instance, in the aggregation of preference relations, they are, um, I mean, the, they are symmetric in uh, permutations over alternatives, so that would be a natural case where one would uh, assign uniform weights. But in uh, other applications, uh, non-uniform weights may um, be uh, important and they could reflect uh, intrinsic importance of, uh, for instance, different positions one elects people to, uh, could reflect probabilities, costs, headcounts. There are many possible interpretations. So uh, formally, it makes the notion of weights make some sense. One has to look in the particular application what, um, whether or not weights in the sense required here in this work do make um, uh, sense and which weights would be the appropriate, how appropriate weights would be determined. Um, uh, we have, so in this setting then a profile, we describe a profile as a probability distribution on uh, input uh, views. Um, so if you think of voters as, uh, or the rule as anonymous, then you use just a relative frequency distribution, but one can think of also new incorporating uh, di different uh, weights by uh, uh, voters, for instance, reflecting their expertise. So a judgment aggregation problem then is a, a profile of views in a particular context C and an aggregation rule maps uh, profiles to um, feasible output choices. Um, now, at the heart of um, this talk of our interest is the um, is the median rule, which in a way is the uh, I mean, it's the simplest rule you could almost de de define. It uses the standard notion of um, just notationally of majority margins which is for an issue is the difference between the fraction of uh, voters who vote yes, uh, one, and the fraction of voters who um, vote uh, no, so assigned a minus one. Um, and so, so the median rule basically maximizes the sum of um, these uh, uh, votes for, for any, the votes obtained for any position the uh, a particular view takes um, weighted by the, um, by the issue weight lambda k. Uh, another way to, um, uh, to characterize or the uh, median rule is as a distance minimizer where the distance between two um, views is the uh, total, the total weight of all uh, on all issues that distinguish the two views. So, from that perspective, the uh, the median rule minimizes the sum or average, let's say, average uh, um, distance to um, the voters. So, both interpretations are very natural conceptually very natural from, from, from judgment aggregation point of view. The first one um, could say ma maximizes issue-wise 
popular or issue-wise evidential support. The second, uh, maximize concordance with views individual-wise, and it combines, uh, is kind of unique in combining these two perspectives. Um, it's a classical uh, um, rule in preference aggregation. Many of you will know it as the Kemeny rule, and it has a st stellar and classic axiomatization by Young and Levinwood. Um, there have been, it has been widely studied before, but there have been um, axiomatizations only in very special cases. So the uh, basic idea for our um, uh, for our work here is the notion of supermajority efficiency, where the idea is that um, in general, you will not, um, well, in, in, in nice cases, you will have, there will be a feasible view, let's say a preference ranking, which will be agree with the, ma with the majority of um, voters use in every, on every issue, on every pair. But as we know, well, uh, this, um, the views can be inconsistent. There's the problem of um, inconsistency, and that's as least as significant a problem in general adjustment aggregation as it is in the aggregation of preferences. So, in all, so this supermajority efficiency governs those uh, trade-offs. And um, so uh, the general idea is that larger majorities, if you have to make the trade-off, larger majorities trump smaller majorities. So um, it is um, for people, some familiarity with economics and or decision theory, that's uh, const construed analogous to the notion of first order stochastic dominance. So uh, formally we look at different um, thresholds Q and we ask for each threshold is the, is the, the total weight of issues on which um, one uh, view agree, agrees with the majority, a majority of size at least Q, uh, how large is that and how does it compare to that of some other view Y? And if the, uh, uh, the sizes for X are always li larger than the sizes for Y, then uh, at least as large and sometimes larger than X supermajority dominates Y. I just give you an example in a second to, um, uh, to illustrate that uh, if, and so uh, supermajority efficient um, uh, view is one which is not super dominated, supermajority dominated by another one. Um, so if we look at uh, example in preference aggregation, three alternatives, a condor C cycle where 70%, 65% and 55% have those pairwise preferences, then um, the, this is the weakest uh, majority. It's natural to overturn that uh, uh, com comparison. So the, and this is given by as a super unique super majority efficient ranking, the ranking A, B, B, C. Um, and in the mechanics of this definition, if we see the ranking, look at the ranking A, A, B, C, then at the threshold 70%, it uh, one, it agrees with the majority on one issue. Uh, at uh, threshold 65%, it agrees on two issues, 55 also on two, not on three, because there's no corner say consistency. So it's basically this, the level of agreement of high super majority, which uh, count. And if you compare to, the other contenders, it is these numbers are at, these values are at least as high or higher um, than uh, for the other two. So that uh, this table basically shows that um, uh, ABC is uniquely to a majority efficient. So um, one um, can. Um, super majority uh, uh, efficient is prototypically realized by additive majority rules. They are defined essentially like um, uh, the median rule, except instead of adding the uh, raw majorities, we add a transform defined by a gain function P. 
And uh, um, now to, um, we will, um, our theory will proceed in two steps. The first is to obtain as an intermediate result, a basic characterization of those additive majority rules, and then obtains the, uh, the characterization of the median rule from uh, basically pinning down, to simplify, pinning down, down phi, uh, phi as linear. In order to do that, we have to oomph up the um, notion of supermajority efficiency. Um, that uh, would is worth explaining more. For reasons of time, I will treat it as a more technical point. The basic idea is to um, to allow to, to conceptually combine different um, different instances of the same type of uh, judgment problem with different profiles and apply supermajority efficiency to this uh, larger combined uh, profile in a larger context. Um, so here it is stated formally and for, uh, yeah, you will, uh, I, I recommend you look at the paper I can there is certainly worth some discussion. Then uh, a standard, we add a standard axiom of uh, continuity, which you can think of as upper hemicontinuity or in context of voting, it's often called overwhelming uh, majority axiom. And uh, the background result for, for this paper is that uh, an aggregation rule F uh, satisfies this, uh, um, Ensemble supermajority efficiency, if and only if it is contained in uh, some additive majority rule, contained meaning profile by profile. And if we um, require continuity, then it is in fact, F is in fact an additive majority. That's uh, the main result in an, in an earlier paper, which has been published two years ago in, in JET. Now, um, the natural question here is, okay, uh, well, what do we need to add um, to go from here to um, the characterization of the median rule? So you could think, okay, corollary is where we add, if it satisfies uh, ensemble supermajority efficiency, um, continuity and um, something, and I'm sure many of you, something will be on the tip of your tongue, the something should be reinforcement. Reinforcement gives, well, you want linearity, reinforcement gives linear boundaries between in the, the domain of profiles. Um, that's a good intuition, but it's not quite correct and it is not so easy to work out. So reinforcement is uh, stated here in the se setting. Essentially, it's a, I mean, it's a very classical axiom due to Pete and Young, I think originally, um, if you have basically, it's a, in this framework, it's a way of describing if, if you two, in two different uh, populations, if, um, if uh, the, uh, basically they come up with the same choice or overlapping choice, then that choice is also the choice of the combined population. Um, the, one needs uh, to make it work, one needs an, an additional assumption that, um, that, uh, why is sufficiently uh, the input is sufficiently rich? Uh, that is that the its convex hull viewed as an uh, a subset of the of the RK has full dimension. So in this case, we can get with this relatively simple assumption, we can get um, uh, a characterization of the median rule for the spe special case of. Uh, equally weighted um, uh, judgment context with equal weights. Now, if we go to weighted contexts, then uh, one would think, okay, that's just, uh, uh, that's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's just you, you add the, okay, you add the, uh, but it's not as straightforward. The uh, theorem does not generalize it. There's a very simple uh, counter example. 
So the upshot is one needs with restrictions on the combinatorial geometry. These are not obvious. So one gets a result of the, um, of the following form that one have uh, F be uh, an aggregation rule on a judgment context with this, uh, um, so that the um, output, input space at least as much as the output space and now we have the former condition that y is six and x satisfies the condition of distality uh, or y is McGarvey, which is a somewhat stronger con richness condition on the input space and x size satisfies a somewhat weaker condition of ruggedness on the um, uh, output space. And under these additional assumptions, then f is the median rule if and only satisfies ensembles with majority efficiency, continuity, and reinforcement. So next slide just gives you a, a, kind of a statement um, what these combinatorial con conditions are. I uh, will show me, uh, okay, one minute. I think I'm at minus one minute now, so I better stop here. Okay, uh, let's uh, unmute and uh, give a round of applause to Klaus. Uh, there was a question uh, from Franz uh, to start with. Um, he asks, uh, could we interpret the weights as the importance of making the correct judgment on the issue? This would take an epistemic perspective by assuming that judgments can be objectively correct or incorrect. And Marcus, um, you gave a few comments there. Do you wanna summarize? Um, uh, verbally, your response to Franz's question? Uh, just that uh, the weights really are more about um, uh, how much priority you assign to the majority opinion on different issues. So basically, the weights are saying if one issue has a higher weight than another, it means the majority view on that weight sort of has more clout over the final decision. So, to the extent that majorities translate into some kind of epistemic interpretation via like Condorcet jury theorem, Franz's intuition might be correct, but that's more, more complicated to make that work than you might think. Thank you. Yes, that makes sense. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, Umberto just came up with a question. Umberto, yeah, I, was, I was interested in what was what's, what's probably following this slide. Uh, if, if you could give some uh, example of a well-behaved domain uh, uh, this, uh, we have, okay, uh, okay we have um, the, um, a simple to get you a, a feeling, I mean, the, to, to get a sense of what these conditions, I guess you are asking for, is if you think about uh, um, preference aggregation, an instance of, of this one, the um, space of linear orderings, then it would satisfy um, the, the second uh, combination being McGarvey an instance of the McGarvey theorem we know and um, the space being rug. So let's just um, uh, in um, here uh, to illustrate the rugness. So think about, if you can do that, think about a, a situation when there are four alternatives and you have a four cycle. That's essentially one tournament which uh, does that. In this case, there will be one ordering, and uh, think about the uh, this um, the so there will be one tournament which differs only in one preference comparison with this uh, with this tournament, one linear order. Um, that, um, but there will be others which um, differ from this uh, majority tournament in other. Um, uh, in, in other comparisons. And these will be in this language, these will be um, adjacent to this uh, majority tournament Z and some differ in, in, in one, some in more. So the distance amount of um, number of uh, alternatives in which they differ will be different. And that's enough to that exhibits ruggedness in this sense. Distality, would be, would be to say that there are um, adjacent pairs must have at least a, um, a distance of three in the case of um, linear, linear orders, every 
adjacent pairs are exactly um, linear orders which differ only in one comparison. So there are no adjacent pairs with distance three, they all have distance two. On the other hand, in the case of equivalence relations, you can, uh, there are um, uh, uh, pairs which have adjacent pairs which have distant, distance three. So this gives you a little feel that distality is, um, it's a substantive restriction. It's, it's roughly stronger than, than ruggedness. And ruggedness we have, we found in basically the examples we were naturally interested, they all, they more or less all satisfied ruggedness with, I mean, a few exceptions I gave part. One of the exceptions was why we came up with these conditions in the first place, um, simple committee problem, which was a way too neat to um, uh, satisfy uh, ruggedness. Thanks. Uh, I had a question I wanted to ask. Uh, it seems to me uh, that we can find ourselves in a situation where we have an axiomatic characterization for a highly general process, but um, that reduces to certain simpler axiomatizations for special cases. And in fact, those, uh, those uh, special case uh, axioms can in some ways shed more light or insight into the nature of the general versions because uh, they are instant instantiations of it. Do you see this um, uh, potential for this current work? Because we have so many yes. specific contexts in which uh, the median procedure. Very, uh, in principle, very much. I mean, that's uh, uh, certainly the, I mean, we this something like this uh, ensemble of majority efficiency is a kind of big axiom and so on. You have uh, something like Pete and Young's Axiomatization in the context of uh, linear orders is certainly more, it's roughly speaking, it's, it's, it's weaker assumptions and more parsimonious assumptions. So you would say in, as a result about aggregation, just linear orders, would, uh, that would be a preferable result. At the same time, it's only about linear orders. As soon as you go to weak orders, um, uh, equivalence relations, anything different, you would need a almost completely different um, uh, type of proof or argument and you don't even know whether you can have it or not. So in this way, I would say one way to look at it is this gives you a, in a way a confident there is axiomatizations all over the place. And depending on the setting, I can kind of simplify it um, more or less. I think one challenge would be, I mean, there are, uh, so that would be an obvious uh, program for the unweighted case, because then you can, for instance, you can disentangle, you can disentangle neutrality, anonymity, um, and quantum sequence consistency, things we pack together in the supermajority efficiency axiom. But with weights, it's not so clear. I mean, we, we don't know under axioms with using weights really, it's not so clear. I mean, there the supermajority efficiency seems to be in a way conceptually the easiest way to uh, have weights enter. So that will be a different level of challenge to um, have interesting axiomatizations, simpler axiomatizations with weights. Mm -hmm. Franz, you had a question you wanted to ask. You have to unmute Franz. Okay, now, thank you. Um, Klaus, you have this interesting idea of um, having an asymmetry between the constraints on individual judgments and the constraints on collective judgments, this Y set and the X set, which yeah, made this. Uh, I am a bit more familiar with a different kind of asymmetry between individuals and the group. Namely, uh, for instance, the individuals have to submit complete and consistent judgments and the collective, for instance, need only be consistent and deductively closed. Yes. That need not be complete. That means the collective can, can abstain on certain issues. Now, this different kind of asymmetry would, at first, one would think not fit into your framework. But on the other hand, something like the median rule can be defined um, even that, in that case, yeah. because you can define the Hamming distance between two judgment sets, uh, one of which or both of which are not complete. And you can uh, therefore define uh, a rule that minimizes the sum total distance um, to the individual judgment sets where we 
optimize not over all fully rational judgment sets, but only say over all consistent deductive closed ones. So bottom line, can you somehow say something about um, those other kinds of asymmetries? Okay, that well, in that context. Okay, good, um, good question, Franz. Uh, I'm. I would think actually the uh, it fits the framework. It doesn't fit one particular assumption we are using here. I mean, if you, uh, for instance, have the assumption then the uh, that the um, uh, people voters uh, input uh, complete and transitive ordering, but uh, let's say uh, the group has only to define some some acyclic ordering, then the uh, basically the output space is larger than the input put space, uh, you can, that, what you can formulate here in terms of the uh, of formalism, it is not, it, it is an admitted assumption and it's governed by the first result about additive majority rules, but we have for technical reasons, I mean, our proof for characterizing the median rule just happens to need the assumption, uh, the inclusion of the um, that the uh, input space is richer than the output space. So there could okay. be, we haven't fully um, thought it through, um, uh, but uh, there could be certainly an uh, open question, or it is an interesting open question to e extend um, the results to, to uh, um, type of scenarios you have in mind. Thanks. Uh, folks, uh, we're coming near the end, but we probably have time for one or two more questions if anyone has any that they want to ask. There are no more in the chat that I found. Maybe I could, maybe if no one has a question, then I could uh, finish with a kind of meta mathematical puzzle. Okay. If that's okay. Sure. Um, so, if it's short. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a half a. Um, so the, the, our full proof of, of this result relies on the axiom of choice. Because we're using additive majority rules are represented by, uh, with hyper real numbers and that's an inter indispensable feature of that result. So the background result in this, for additive majority rules, it's, well, it's natural that it uses the axiom of choice. Now what it is used to is to uh, provide a characterization of the median rule which is the kind of, can be stated in the most elementary way. And on the face of it, there is no obvious um, reason why you would need uh, a proof using the axiom of choice um, to, uh, to characterize it. So uh, the, the puzzle is, is that, is that um, really a, a necessary feature or um, is it just because we had an idiosyncratic way of proving it? Good question. Uh, okay, folks, let's uh, unmute and give uh, uh, Klaus a second round of applause. Thank you. Thank I, you want, I want to ask uh, the speakers to not forget to send us uh, PDF versions of their slides so we can post them on the site. And now I think Ulla has something to say uh, to us about the next meeting of the seminar. I do indeed. So um, we are uh, switching to Fridays uh, from the next meeting on for the next few months. And then we'll see again what we're going to do about dates. Uh, so next meeting is uh, two weeks and one day from now. It's going to be a rump session. That means we're going to have eight speakers who will each give a five minute talk. So not a lot of vowels, but uh, I think it will still be very interesting. I'm looking forward to it. And you're all very welcome to join us for that. And then two weeks after that, we are back with a normal session. Okay, folks, I think that does it for today. See you in two weeks. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.